All right, let's get started. Uh, hi, my name is John Vance, president of Vance Wealth. I will be your presenter tonight. Uh, and uh, we are, uh, the topic of our conversation today is retirement tax strategy. So basically what we're gonna go through is as you prepare for retirement or if you're in retirement, is really what tax strategy should you be looking at to better prepare yourself to pay lower taxes over your lifetime? Um, and specifically, we'll also get into how some of the recent tax changes will impact your retirement income you know, and obviously the taxes surrounding that. Uh, and when I refer to the recent tax changes, we had a couple of tax changes in 2017. Uh, we had some in 2019. Uh, and then we have some on the horizon for, uh, for 2021, still unknown at this time. But that's going to be our, our main focus today. Uh, from a kind of a housekeeping uh, perspective, uh, number one, this, this uh, webinar is going to be recorded and we'll have this on replay. Uh, and now we'll send that out to any attendees. Uh, and uh, from a Q&A perspective, you can ask questions at any time using the Q&A tool. So if you have things that are on your mind, please, you know, queue them up as we go uh, and go ahead and put them in there. And then what I'll do is at the end, uh, once we, I've, we've gone through all the content, I will go ahead and, and kind of read some of the questions and do my best to answer those. Uh, so, um, and then also uh, we had mentioned that, you know, this is going to be recorded. It, it will be posted to, to YouTube. So we'll have a, uh, you'll be able to, to, to view this again. Because I know sometimes when we go through, uh, you know, tax strategies or dealing with, you know, more complicated issues, there can definitely be, uh, definitely feel like drinking through a fire hose. Because there's a lot of information. So that's me. I'm your speaker. I'm a certified financial planner. Uh, I started Vance Wealth back in 2003. Uh, current, so almost 20 years. Uh, currently, we serve about 30, excuse me, 300 households. Uh, and we manage about $485 million, uh, almost a half a billion. Uh, we established actually our own registered investment advisor firm uh, back in the fall of 2020 um, and, you know, just basically it made us more independent and really upholding the fiduciary standard, which means we put our clients interests first. So hope you enjoy. We're going to cover a lot of topics. You know, one thing real quick, um, I am a certified financial planner. I'm not a CPA. So a lot of the strategies we're going to be discussing today will be around taxes, around tax planning. Uh, so one of the things that I would encourage you is as you go through and maybe take notes on things that I discuss, if there are things that pop out that are like, you know what, this might be relevant to me, these are items that you definitely want to run by your tax professional, whether it's a CPA enrolled agent, to make sure they apply to you. Because uh, today, you know, we are going to cover a lot of issues from a general perspective, and it's, it's hard to give that advice on a one-on-one on a one -on -one perspective. So our goal for today, so a couple things if we if we look here, uh, we are gonna go through and talk about some of the relevant changes uh, to personal income taxes from the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. This was the tax policy that Trump had signed into law in 2017 and it was effective in 2018. Now, I know that it has been about you know, over three years since, the, since that's been put in place, but I do wanna just go through some of the high level items. Now it's all, I think, more, um, uh, uh, you know, most of us have kind of memorized some of the rule changes, but I just want to go through and just remind you of some of those high level changes because it did have some impact on retirement tax strategy. Um, uh, the other item we want to go through is talk about um, the, um, the, the CARES Act, which deals with um, some of the, the, the planning items um, that were put in place right around when, when COVID was started. Uh, and actually, uh, technically, it's called the SECURE Act. So this was a SECURE Act that was put in place that made some changes to IRA distributions, and we'll go through that. And then the 2021 Biden tax changes, there's been a lot of proposals. Obviously, we're now here in September, and no changes have been made. So we still have a little bit of time, but it does look like it's on the horizon trying to make its way through, uh, through the House and then obviously to, to um, President Biden's desk. Uh, but we haven't seen anything yet. So I don't want to over-speculate on that, but I will cover a couple items, and we do have a webinar that we'll reference. So those are kind of the goals for at a high level, but also we want to identify tools and strategies that are available to middle income retirees, you know, things that you can do to mitigate your tax liability over your lifetime. Um, one of the key things too, is we want to avoid uh, the political conversation, stick to actionable. So, you know, this is not going to be whether the Trump tax cuts were good and the Biden tax cuts were good or vice versa. We're really just going to go through like what's happening, what's the reality because that's the, the, that's the environment we live in. That's the environment we're going to pay tax in. And it doesn't really make a ton of sense to kind of 
really vet and go back and forth whether they're good or bad. Um, the one thing at the bottom of the screen on the bottom left you can see is this is really designed to be kind of a two-part workshop, two-part webinar. Um, but really today, part one being an hour-long general education where we're going to cover these topics. Uh, but then the other offer that we have, and we'll make this available at the end, is just a reminder. Um, part two is really a 30-minute uh, complimentary Zoom consultation for customized advice, right? So if as we're going through this, you're like, you know what, I have specific questions that I don't want to ask through this format. I want to have a consultation. You know, we will we'll make available some time slots uh, so that you can schedule that individual time because I know it might be around more specific information to your, your uh, situation. So, all right. Let me just drink a little water there. All right. So we're going to jump right into the numbers and there's going to be a few things we're going to be referencing uh, during our conversation today. Um, but when we look at this, there's a lot of data here, but really simply what we're looking at is prior to the Trump tax uh, changes, which was in 2017, you can see listed on here the tax rates, the different tax brackets. So on the left-hand side, you're looking at the single rates, so, so filing uh, as a single. And on the right-hand side, you're looking at the rates for married filing jointly, or the abbreviation is MFJ. So you're going to see MF, MFJ referenced throughout um, our conversation today. So I'm going to focus just our conversation on the, on the right-hand side because it doesn't make sense to really go through both. But so looking at married filing jointly, back in 2017, the tax brackets were 10%, 15%, uh, 25%, 28, 33, 35, and the highest was 39.6. This is just federal. And so you can see there, that was the 2017 rates. And then the rates that put in place be between 2018 and current, um, we have them referenced here as 2021 rates. You can see they lowered the brackets pretty much across the board. So there's a 10% bracket, a 12% bracket, 22, 24%, 32, 35, and 37. So pretty much across the board from, uh, let's say, lower, lower income, middle income, and upper income, saw a tax, uh, tax reduction uh, across the board. And so why do I have these highlighted colors on here? So the one thing when this, when this tax bill was passed is that they had a sunset provision. And the sunset provision basically said that unless Congress, unless the president passed new legislation, the tax rates are going to revert back to the 2017 levels. And if you notice in the green, it says potential tax rates in 2026, and actually the disclosure on the bottom. So they're set to expire on 1231, 2025 without new legislation. So we're waiting on that. And the reason why there's some highlighted notes on here is we really look at the fact that <clears throat> prior to these changes, the tax brackets of 25, 28, and 33, those are higher than the current rates of 22 and 24. So the reason we're calling this out is that if you're on the verge of retiring or just newly retired, you might be in a position, even though you're retiring, where your tax rates today, from a percentage perspective, are lower because of the new tax policy. And in 2026, they might go up. So this gives us a window 2021, 22, 23, 24, and 25, to really look at, are there things we can do today from a tax planning perspective, Roth conversions, uh, more distributions from IRAs, accelerating capital gains, things that you can do over the next five years and potentially pay taxes at lower rates. So that's why we kind of jumped right into these numbers because that's what we're looking at doing. Good tax strategy should be around this idea that you know what, I, I do want to save money in this tax year, but really my goal is if I look at my lifetime, whether that's another 20 or 30 years, how can I make sure I pay the least amount of taxes uh, based on my financial situation? So if we can spread out a lower tax liability over a long period of time versus just focusing on one, one year individually and trying to minimize it, we like to do it over your lifetime because if we can minimize your tax liability over your lifetime, that's more money for you, for your spouse, for your family that you can pass on just a much more efficient way. And I know in the conversations that we've had is, you know, we want to save taxes if we can. So one of the misconceptions from a tax perspective is how the tax code works. So if you notice here at the top left, it says MFJ. So again, that's married filing jointly. And this is just looking at ordinary income tax. And it's called this tax map, which basically lays out 
the different levels of taxes. So, so the very bottom, you can see these brackets, zero to 27,000, 27,000 to 47,000, and so on. All the way up on the far right, it's 656,000. So what this basically means is that essentially every married filing jointly um, cup, uh, tax filer, their first $27,700 if they're over um, 65 is going to be tax-free. Uh, they don't pay any tax on that. So if you notice, the tax liability doesn't kick in until that 27700 number. And then when it kicks in, then you're taxed at 10%. So you can see your next two brackets are at 10 and 12%. And that takes you all the way up to about 108,000. So that next circle that I highlighted there, that's at the next 108, that's at the 108,000 level. That's when it jumps up, it jumps up quite a bit, right? So it goes from a 10 to 12% bracket to 22. So almost doubling of the, of the tax percentage, right? And then you can see uh, you have your tax rate at 22, then 24. And then again here, you see another big jump up to 32%. So these are pretty significant increases. And you know, one of the, I, I guess at a very high level, you know, not knowing your individual situation, but we kind of look at when you're at the tax rate of zero, obviously zero is great because that's free, but we also look at the 10 and 12% tax brackets as that's really inexpensive. Uh, those are really inexpensive taxes. We don't mind paying that. So that's where the planning comes into looking at your overall financial situation is, does it actually make sense to accelerate some income so that you're using up these, these bottom brackets? Additionally, the 22 and 24% bracket might be looked at because as I showed you on the previous screen, there might be a, a, a case for the tax code sunsetting and going back to the previous, uh, previous tax rates, which means that 28% tax bracket could, could come into play, right? So that's a deeper dive that individuals have to look at and say, am I willing to pay tax today at these 22 and 24% brackets? Because I might avoid paying at 28 later. And that's, again, a very individualized conversation. But the important thing to know when looking at this is that, you know, there is this concept of, you know, I'm going to move into the next tax bracket. Um, it's a little bit of a misconception in that when you move into the next tax bracket, you're just paying taxes on the amount that you're in the new bracket, right? So if you're $1 into the 32% tax bracket, you only pay that higher 32% taxes on that $1. The rest of the income is taxed the same. In fact, if you look at the lower bracket, a married filing jointly couple making 30,000 and a married filing jointly uh, couple making a million dollars on that first $27,700, they actually pay the same rate, which would be at zero. So that's important, that's important to understand from a tax perspective. So let me just uh, go back in time and talk a little bit about how the tax changes in 2017 impacted deductions. And so this is probably one of the most significant part of the, the, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was how deductions were treated. So as a tax filer, you either have the option of doing a standard deduction, which is just a predetermined standard number, or you can itemize. And itemizing is what you do on your Schedule A, and it's listed here. Uh, you can see just under standard. So we're going to talk about standard first. And so prior to this change, the standard deduction for uh, married couples was around 12,000 and single was around six. So the standard deduction essentially doubled with this tax change. So it gave a lot of earners much higher deductions uh, and, and, it, and, and, and in essence, it lowered their tax liability. In 2021, these numbers are 25,100 for married couples and uh, 12,550 for single filers. So that's the reality. And then in changing the deductions and, and raising them, it's, and, and they also kind of uh, part of the tax code is they change some of the rules. And I know we're familiar with this, but again, I wanna go through and, re and reiterate this and remind. So itemized deductions. So this is, again, is it all picked up on your schedule A? So one of your itemized deductions is mortgage interest deduction. So they capped the ability to deduct your interest expense on debt up to 750,000. That's only on newly acquired debt. If you had debt in place prior to the end of 17, you could do up to a million dollars. Um, and even if you refinance, you still get that million dollars protected. But that was something that they, they lowered the, that, that interest deduction. Charitable gifts, um, they did, um, you know, they, they essentially kept intact in some of the charitable gifts, um, basically being able to do cash or check up to 60% of adjusted gross income. Uh, the most significant change to the alternative, um, excuse me, to the itemized deductions 
is a state and uh, local tax deduction. So this was this is known as SALT, the SALT tax, which is state and local tax. Now, prior, uh, you know, especially being in the state of California, where you have high property taxes, high income taxes, you know, we have a lot of earners who are paying one hundred thousand in in taxes, one hundred fifty thousand in state and local taxes, even fifty thousand. Right, so they actually are now in a position where they get capped. So this is really punitive for some of the higher tax states like California, New York, New Jersey. Um, this is now capped at ten thousand dollars. Again, we all know this because this happened several years ago, but it's just a reminder of the changes that occurred. And that's ten thousand whether you're married, ten thousand whether you're single. So that was the big kind of adjustment that was made, and it it really, I guess it it forced us to start looking at tax planning and okay, based on this reality, what are some of the things that we can, we can look at doing? So, so that's the, that was the landscape for the standard deductions versus itemized deductions. They also eliminated the miscellaneous deductions. Um, the other thing that I think most investors or just most individuals aren't aware of is how capital gains and qualified dividends get treated, how they get taxed and they get taxed differently. And when I talk about capital gains, let's talk more specifically about what I mean. So you have long-term capital gains and short-term capital gains. So short-term capital gains are anything, uh, any gain that you have on an asset, whether that be real estate, stock, ETF, mutual fund, short-term being three un under one year. So less, you've owned it for less than 365 days. So that's considered short-term capital gains. Those are taxed at ordinary income. So when you saw that tax map that I had with the red stair step, your tax at ordinary income. So that's not that hasn't changed. They're, they're taxed in its own in its own way. Long-term capital gains, however, are gains that uh, are assets that you've held for longer than a year. So longer than 365 days, they have their own tax bracket. And their tax brackets are actually lower than, than ordinary income. They're lower. And this applies for also for qualified dividends, which for all intents and purposes, it covers dividends from most mutual funds, dividends from most stocks, dividends from most ETFs, not all, certainly, but um, but just know they do get a different treatment. Now, part of the Biden tax uh, proposal or the tax changes is that potentially above 400,000 or above a million dollars of income, there might be an adjustment where uh, they don't they, they, they change the way that they're taxed. And so just to give you a frame of reference, this is how long-term capital gains are taxed. And these are the brackets uh, if you're married filing jointly. So uh, one of the cool things about this, depending on your income level, is if you are in a temporary lower income level, maybe you're retired, you're not getting your pension yet, you may be living off some cash, some savings. Uh, if your taxable income is between zero and 80,000, your capital gains bracket on the federal level is zero, which basically means if you sold and took some profits on something and you were in this lower bracket, you're going to pay zero capital gains tax. The next bracket is from 80,000 to 500,000. You're at 15%. And then above 20, uh, excuse me, above 500,000, you're at the 20% capital gains rate. Now, you do have state tax uh, rates on top of that. So depending on what state you live in, uh, you'll have that in California. You know, the, the highest tends to be nine to 10%, again, depending on your income. Uh, so this is just the federal piece. Uh, you see a little footnote at the bottom, might be a little hard to read. The proposal is that uh, if you get above a million dollars, you'll be taxed at ordinary income. So that's the change that uh, Biden has proposed. Instead of having this 20% capital gains rate is that if you make over a million in capital gains or in dividends, you're going to be paying at ordinary income levels, not at this tax preference capital gains rate. So it means it would jump from 20% to 37% or they're even proposing 39.6. Now, most of you on the webinar, most most you know, most citizens of the United States are in, are not likely in most cases going to be having income that taxable income above a million dollars. And so, a lot of people look at this, say, "Well, this doesn't really impact me. It only impacts the truly wealthy." And for the most part, I think that's a fair uh, that's a fair statement. However, where it's where where it is a little bit misleading is you know we're seeing this a lot in California where people are downsizing their large homes, they're maybe moving to another state, especially if they're retired. And so the reality is, is, you know, we know countless amount of people who bought homes here in the 60s and 70s, you know, for less than $100,000. It could have been 20,000, 30,000, 40,000. And those homes are now selling for two and a half, three million, four million, five million. So the reality is, you know, we have a lot of homeowners in here in California that if they're downsizing and selling, they could have, they could have a few million dollars of gains. And so while they may not deem themselves as high earners, they're high earners for a year. And so what could happen is that decision to sell or downsize or move 
could cause them to be in a much higher bracket instead of paying at a 20% rate, you know, maybe even high as 40%. So that could really cut into not only their profits, but the money that they're walking away from their house that they might want to reinvest into to something else. So again, just wanted to share with you a little bit around how the long-term capital gains work. We don't know on the Biden proposal. Uh, it's not super popular in terms of making those changes. So not sure if that's going to stall, um, but stay tuned. So there's also another tax. This has been around for a little while. Um, this was put in place to pay for some of the additional um, what we would call the Obamacare Affordable Care Act provisions. So basically, there's an additional 3.8% net investment income tax. So basically, it's an additional tax assessed if you are just a gross income as a single filer is over 200,000. And if you're married over 250,000. And basically, it's assessed on any net investment income, which would be capital gains and dividends, interest payments, annuity payments, passive business income, rents from, uh, from real estate. So this is an additional tax on top of that. So the chart here before basically lays out, you know, this is the traditional, but on top of that, we have the net investment income tax, which is, a, which is an extra tax on, on top of that. So when we start talking about the real tax system, you know, especially for what I would call pre-retirees or retirees, what does this look like? So we just, you know, and, and kind of going down this bulleted list here, we covered capital gains. We talked about this 3.8% net, net investment income tax. But what I want to go through now is really talking about required minimum distributions, right? That has to happen once you hit age 72. Social security benefits, right? Most people are going to be collecting some sort of social security benefits. When's the optimal time to take it? What are some of the nuances around taxes? We're going to get into that. Uh, Medicare premiums, right? So if you make a certain amount of money, you might have to pay higher Medicare premiums. And then from a planning perspective, what are the things you can do around potential Roth conversions, maybe taking larger uh, withdrawals from the, for your IRAs. You know, that bottom item really is individualized. There's not like a general statement that I say, do this because it always makes sense. It really comes down to your own unique tax situation. Um, but this is when we start looking at the real tax system, especially for retirees. Uh, we're gonna get into the weeds here a little bit and, and, and to help educate uh, on some of these areas. So we're gonna talk now about how do RMDs work? So RMD stands for required minimum distribution. And the required minimum distribution basically applies to pre-tax accounts, right? So pre-tax accounts would be things like IRAs, SEP IRAs, 401ks, 403bs, 457, deferred comp, right? So any of these retirement plans that you've been funding over the years, that's what this would apply to. Now, if you're still working, uh, and, and, and you, you have to actually start taking them out at age 72, if you're still working, there are some provisions where you might not have to. Uh, I'm not going to spend much time on that, but just be aware of there are some provisions. But the year you reach age 72 is when you have to begin taking your required minimum distributions. Now, uh, most of you probably were aware this used to be 70 and a half. So at age 70 and a half, um, that's when the RMDs uh, used to have to be taken, but the, the, the SECURE Act of 2019 changed that and moved it to 72. And I'm super thankful for that. I think getting that extra year and a half is, is crucial and also getting rid of the half year. Like doing the half year just became kind of a headache to figure out, okay, am I, is this my half year? Is it my full year? So now that it's 72, it's way cleaner. You can do simple math. And so basically how the RMD works is the year you reach uh, age 72 is when you have to take your first distribution. And that means if you have a birthday in January or December, it doesn't matter. You have to take it in that year. Now, you, can, you, have to, you have all the way up till the end of the year to take it. Um, and so basically, how do you calculate well, how much you want to take out? So let's assume you have a million dollar balance. Now, this can be a million dollar balance in one account, or it can be a million dollar balance spread among two accounts, three accounts, five accounts. Unfortunately, we do see too many of you like to collect retirement accounts. Uh, it's generally recommended, not in all cases, but to consolidate them. It just makes it easier for management. Um, and you, know, you can run your asset allocation a little bit tighter. Um, but from an RMD perspective is that if you have it in multiple places, if it's 401ks, you have to take it individually. If it's IRAs, you, could you can aggregate it and take it from one if you want to. But the general rule of thumb should just be take, it, take the RMDs kind of from, e from each account based on their balance. And so if your aggregate balance is a million dollars, the way that um, you determine your RMD is there's a IRS publishes what's called a life expectancy factor. And so at age 72, that factor is 25.6. So basically what you do is you take your million dollars, 
which was the basically year end balance. So it was the 1231, let's just presume this year. So 1231 of 2020, the balance was a million. You divide it by a life expectancy factor, and then that gives you the number you have to take out. So you have to take out 39,000 by the end of this year. So by December 31st of this year, you have to take out about a little bit over 39,000. Now, I did put a little note at the bottom that says the withdrawal rate. So the withdrawal rate is 3.9%, and uh, that's essentially the percentage that you have to take out based on the, the RMD factor. Um, this is also a, um, uh, this is a helpful table. Uh, this is easy to Google uh, and, and get this information. This is published from the IRS. Uh, but basically, this shows you at each age bracket what your distribution period. So if you look at on this age 72, the factor was 25.6. And as you kind of move down this list at age 78, it's closer to 20, which means your withdrawal rate at that time would be closer to 5%. And then if you look at age, let's say 92, your, your distribution period is 10, uh, is 10 years, 10.2. So that means your withdrawal percentage is about 10%. So as you get older, you're gonna be required to take more and more out and pay more taxes. And the reason why that's significant is that if, you're, you know, if your account balance continues to grow, especially early on, you're gonna have larger and larger distributions, which creates different tax issues for your social security um, benefits and uh, your pension benefits and other, other areas because you're required to take the money out. Even if you don't need it, you have to take it. Even if you wanna reinvest it, you can reinvest it elsewhere, but it can't be in the retirement plan. So you have to pay that tax. Um, additionally, as a side note, uh, the SECURE Act also made a change in 2019 that basically eliminated um, what's called a um, SEP, or, sorry, a stretch IRA provision. So you used to be able to pass your IRAs onto your children and then they could take that money out over their lifetime. And so essentially the new changes basically are forcing the distribution out over 10 years, which you know that sometimes now has become a big drawback of people accumulating these large IRAs, knowing that if they leave it to their child or children, uh, that they're passing on a really large tax liability. So that's an important part of the SECURE Act is basically it's now needs to be paid out over a 10 year period. Okay, so transitioning into Social Security. So this is probably one of the more uh, data heavy pieces because I'm gonna get into things like how are social security benefits taxed? Um, and it can be a little bit confusing, uh, but we're gonna talk about how does the calculation work? How do you solve for provisional income? You know, Basically go through the formulas. Now I will just warn you ahead of time, if you look at some of the data and you're like, wow, this is just too much, too much information, at the end of the day, don't worry about it. There's good uh, financial planning calculator tools that can help do this math. Uh, we can help assist with that. So it's not a big deal. I just mainly want you to get the concept, not necessarily how it works, uh, but just that it is more as a high level that, it, uh, you know, basically how the, the, the benefits are taxed so that you have a, a better understanding and how like it applies to your overall tax picture. So when, we, when we're trying to figure out how much of your social security benefits will be subject to taxation, it's based on a provisional income calculation. And the way you get to a provisional income is you take half of your social security benefits plus ordinary income. So ordinary income could be things like pension, bank interest, annuity payouts, any sort of um, ordinary income. IRA distributions is ordinary income. You then would also then add dividends that were paid and any realized capital gains, right? So if you sell anything and you have a gain, realized capital gains. And then the fourth bucket is non-taxable interest. So essentially non-taxable interest is municipal bond interest. And if you're not familiar, municipal uh, bonds that are is issued by municipalities, uh, the interest that they're paid is tax-free at the federal level. And so from a provisional income perspective, they want to, uh, Social Security wants to make sure that you know, any higher net worth people that have a lot of municipal bonds that they add that back in. So the municipal bond interest is not taxable. However, looking at your provisional income calculation, they do add that back in so that they're getting an accurate reflection of how much income somebody is getting. So that's how you get to the provisional income calculation. And when we start looking at these benefits thresholds, I will warn you that the, the thresholds are really low. So to pay no tax on social security uh, your provisional income as a single filer needs to be below 25,000, which would be pretty hard to live here in California. And as a married filing jointly to have to pay zero taxes on your social security benefits, you would need to be below 32,000. So that's kind of the, those, those upper numbers. Now, a couple quick things to note about social security taxation. 
Um, you do not pay state tax, state income tax on social security wages. You don't pay it on any of it. Also, everybody gets 15%, 1-5% of their social security benefits tax-free. So if you notice on the screen that shows these thresholds for single at 34,085% and then at 44,085%. So basically that means that if your provisional income is above those thresholds, let's just talk about the married filing jointly, uh, at 44,000, anything above that 44,000, basically 85% um, of your social security benefits will be added to your taxable income. Now, that doesn't mean that's how much you pay in taxes. You don't pay 85% in taxes. It basically means that's how much is added to your income. And then you pay tax based on the bracket that you're in, right? So remember at the very beginning, we talked about the different brackets, the 10, 12%, tw uh, 22, 24, the different brackets. So all this is trying to do is figure out how much is subject to taxation. And then once we figure out how much is subject to taxation, then it gets added into your taxable income and tax at your current rate. So the takeaway shouldn't be, John said that 85% of my social security is gonna be taxed. Well, technically that is right. It just, you don't pay, you're not paying tax at an 85% rate. Okay, so a couple of quick examples we're going to go through, and there's two slides that are going to deal with the, the same issue, and this is really just hypothetical. Um, and the, the inside the blue boxes is really the math. Don't worry about the math. Let's just stay high level. So this is an example where you had somebody who has 20,000 of Social Security benefits, plus they're taking 40,000 annually from their IRA, which gives them a provisional income of $50,000, right? They have total income of 60, but provisional income is 50, correct? because it's half of the social security benefits. <clears throat> then we have another scenario where someone's making 40,000 of social security benefits and they're getting 20,000 of IRA withdrawals. So it's the same 60,000, but in this example, the provisional income at the bottom is uh, only 40 because uh, only half of the social security is taxed. On the far right-hand side, you can see total taxable benefit. So because the provisional income is higher on the, on the scenario above, the amount that's gonna be subject to tax is $11,100. On the bottom, the total taxable benefit is 4,000. So look at the math on that. If someone is getting 40,000 of social security and their provisional income is lower, their taxable amount or the, what's subject to tax is only 4,000, which basically means they only have to pay tax on 10% of their social security and 90% of their social security benefits will be tax-free. Now, when we start looking at how does this factor into their tax return, so, you know, the taxable social security was 11,000, other income was 40, which is the IRA, total taxable income 51. I know I'm moving through this pretty quickly, but I, I just want to make sure you get, we get to the point. You have your standard deduction of 26,000, your taxable income is 24,000, your total federal tax liability is roughly 2,500. So that's the scenario where, you know, you have more money coming out of your IRA, and some of your, in about 50, a little bit over 50% of your social security benefits are subject to tax. Now we have the other side, which basically hardly any of your taxable, of your social security was subject to taxation, only 4,000 of the 40. And then look what happens. Because of the way that's calculated, you basically have no taxable income and no federal income tax due in this, in this scenario. So obviously if your income is substantially higher, this is not gonna to apply to you, but there might be some windows where you know, those of you in your, in your 60s, you might have some opportunity to have a few years where your income tax liability is pretty low. And, and, you know, and if you can you know, avoid or reduce the tax liability, it makes sense to at least uh, explore those opportunities. Um, the other thing, and don't wanna spend a ton of time on here, but just so that you're aware, um, as your income grows, and so if you look at these income brackets, uh, this doesn't really apply to you get above 176,000, uh, but once you're above $176,000 married filing jointly, you start having these additional Medicare premiums. Uh, so as you hit these new brackets, you'll have to start paying more, uh, a higher Medicare premium charge every year. That tends to get, or sorry, every month, that tends to get deducted directly from your social security checks. But just to be aware, um, when you look at these numbers, one of the things that's, I think a little bit scary for individuals is if you go $1 above, you have to pay the higher premium. And so that's where managing your tax liability is really important because, I mean, how bad would that be? Excuse me, how bad would that be is to go a dollar above it and then have to pay maybe a few thousand dollars in extra premiums just because you went one dollar above. So that's where keeping an eye on some of the, these thresholds is, is really important. 
All right. So moving right along, a couple of just uh, like more just quick reminders on on how some of these things work. So as a reminder, Social Security benefits, the your your benefits are based on your best thirty five years. Uh, and when you and when you get statements, or I should say, when they used to send you statements, you would have this this nice like four page document that would give you all your earnings history. Essentially, now those are all online. So if you haven't done it already, I'd really recommend go on to ssa.gov, create an account. Uh, I would also review it annually because, you know, the, the your Social Security benefits are only as good as the data uh, that's collected by the IRS. And, you know, I think we can all agree there's times where government doesn't get the data right. So you want to double check your earnings history, make sure there's not any mistakes, because if there are mistakes, if income is understated, then your benefits are going to be lower. So I would re highly recommend set up an account, run some projections. Um, when you when you get on there, there's basically three income items. You have your primary insurance amount, which is known as full retirement age, which right now is going to be somewhere between 66 and 67. Uh, you have your benefit at age 70. So that's the latest age that you would wait because it, after age 70, it doesn't continue to accumulate or grow for, for, for delaying. Or you can do early retirement, which is a benefit at age 62. So those are the three amounts. Now, this is just basically, and you can read through some of the disclosures on there, but this is kind of the, this is the stated amount based on your current earnings history and what they're projecting for you. If you know, as an example, let's say you're 60 years old and you say, you know what, I'm going to retire at 60, but I'm not going to take my social security benefits until I'm 70. You can go into the calculator and say, okay, I'm retiring now. I have no more benefits paid into social security, but I don't want to collect my, uh, my social security till age 70. It will rerun the numbers. And that's actually important to look at because the, the system kind of defaults to assuming you're just going to keep working until that, that age. And so if you know you're not going to, you want to run real estimates when it comes to the social security calculator. So again, highly recommended, get into the ssa.gov, set up an account and make sure you fully understand how your benefits work. Um, couple, uh, one, a couple of just, I'm going to go through spousal benefits and some divorce spouse benefits. So the key thing to know is that if you have a household where you have one, one primary earner and one that has no work history, um, the, the, the individual that has no work history, and you can see on here, we have um, Jeremy and Samantha. Jeremy's primary uh, amount is $2,200 at full retirement. Samantha is zero, uh, basically means she didn't have any work history. Um, and that, that was probably a lot more common 20, 30 years ago. Uh, definitely, we're not seeing that now. It's definitely much more of... Uh, of you know, two, two earners in a household and higher earners, and it, and it, and it varies on who actually um, is eligible for spousal benefits, but it goes both ways, husband or wife, it doesn't really matter. Um, you know, the spousal benefits can be based on the high, highest earning spouse, which is really important to know. So in this example, though, the data you see in the middle is that your the spousal benefits, you're eligible for up to 50% of, of your spouse's benefits. So Jeremy, since Jeremy's eligible for 2200, Samantha is eligible for 1100. Now, there are some rules about filing. So, for example, to collect spousal benefits, your spouse actually has to have filed. Um, so that can get a little bit tricky unless you're the exactly the same age and have the same birthday. You know, if you have a year or five or even 10 years between, that's where some of the spousal benefit calculation and planning can get a little bit tricky. Um, but essentially, if you're the same age, then it's, then it's fairly clean because you can collect at the same time. So, so you also have the ability to look at... Um, potentially collecting a spousal benefit for a period of time and then switching to your own benefit. Um, so those are some of the nuances with, with when it comes down to social security planning to be a little bit uh, more creative. Uh, so the other thing is when we look at divorce, uh, there's a couple important things to know. You may be eligible if you are divorced, you may be eligible for spousal benefit under the divorce provision. Um, some of the rules that apply, you can see kind of listed down here on the left, you have to be married to your ex-spouse for at least 10 years. So you need a 10 year plus marriage to be currently unmarried. And then you both need to be at least age 62 and then both, uh, excuse me, then divorce for at least two years. So in order to qualify for those benefits, now don't get excited by if you do qualify, your, your ex doesn't get less money. It's just built into the social security system. Uh, and then there's also some survivor benefits. Uh, you can see kind of the notes there. So it might be something worth, worth exploring is really evaluating what are my spousal benefits if I am divorced versus what are my own benefits. And there might be some planning opportunities that you can look at uh, to make sure you get your kind of fair share of the, uh, the social security payout. All right, so as we kind of transition into 
a couple planning areas. I kind of call this section tools for tax control, right? When we talk about tax control is that, you know, we, when you're earning your, and you're working, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're making wages, you're paying taxes, right? A lot, most of that's getting withheld from your W-2. Um, and, you know, when you start thinking about, okay, well, do you have much control of your tax liability? Well, the more money you make, the more taxes you pay. Um, but when you start getting into, uh, when you stop relying on your paycheck and you start relying on your assets, you start having more control, right? You get to determine when you take your social security. You get to determine a lot of times when you take your pension, if you take it early or at full retirement. You also get to decide what accounts you wanna take it out of. So when we start thinking about accumulating assets, we've always recommended and we continue to do so, is you wanna diversify, diversify among account types. And when you think about the three primary ones, and we have these listed here, is you have IRA assets or 401k assets. And so one bucket is called pre-tax money, right? IRA, 401k, 457, 403b, right? These are all accounts where when you put the money in there, you get the tax deduction up front. And then when you take it out, you or sorry, you get the tax deduction up front, you get deferral along the way, right? As your money earns money, you don't pay tax. And then you pay tax when you withdraw it. So anything that comes out of these pre-tax accounts, you have to pay tax. Then there's another bucket called Roth. Roth accounts can apply to Roth IRAs, Roth conversions, Roth 401ks. And these buckets basically are, you fund them with post-tax money, meaning you didn't get a deduction, you put after-tax money and the, the gains inside the accounts can accumulate tax sheltered. And then when you take it out, you don't pay tax. So it's not a tax event to take money out of the Roth. Now there are a couple weird provisions in terms of having to have an account in place for five years or definitely some nuances there, but essentially you take the money out of the Roth completely tax-free. Um, one of the things just to know is there's many of you who come in with a conception of, oh, I'm not eligible for a Roth, I make too much money. So that's just for Roth IRA contributions, but a lot of cases you might not be eligible for a Roth IRA contribution, but you are eligible for a conversion and you are eligible for a Roth 401k or you might be. So don't just look at the face value, the fact that you might not hit the income restrictions or you might, you might not hit the income limits or you're over the income limits for Roth IRAs and just discount that you might not be eligible because in many cases you are gonna be eligible for the conversion and also the Roth 401k. So that's the second bucket, the Roth. And then the third bucket is just what we call kind of non-qualified. It's just taxable accounts, right? These would be like bank accounts, brokerage accounts, trust accounts, anything that you've already paid tax on, you put the money in there and you can invest it. And as you invest that money, you pay tax on interest, you pay tax on uh, dividends, you pay tax on capital gains. You kind of just pay tax as you go and, on realized capital gains. And so the beauty when we talk about tools for tax control is when you're now in retirement or getting ready for retirement, you get to decide where is the money coming from? You take it from the pre-tax, you got to pay uh, full income tax on that. Take it from the Roth, you don't pay any. And you take it from the brokerage account, you'll have some tax and some of it will be tax-free. So it just comes down to now you have more control. And when you have that control, then you can kind of look through the tax planning world and through that lens and really look and say, okay, what can I do to minimize my tax exposure today, next year, and in the foreseeable future? And so that's where we want to use different types of accounts. Sometimes we want to own different assets in different accounts because there's some investments that are more tax advantage to hold in an IRA versus in a, in a non-qualified account. So that's where some of the nuances get into just being a little bit more sophisticated with the planning. But you do have an opportunity if you are retired in this, in this kind of 60 to 72 range where you have a lot more control around your taxes and it's a great time to take advantage of that and make sure you're not missing opportunities. So one of the things that I do want to go through... Uh, sometimes it's going to be a little hard to explain, but um, most of our clients are charitably inclined, not all, but most. Uh, and, you know, the, the giving ranges from, you know, on the low end to a couple thousand to, you know, north of a hundred thousand. So, but I would say the typical, you know, uh, charitable uh, people who are making charitable gifts is like five to 20,000, right? So one of the things that, one of the parts of the tax code that I guess it got simpler, but it also took away some of the advantages for charitable giving uh, was the fact that they changed how itemized deductions, uh, they, they, they added some complications in the itemized deductions. Now, I started the, this, the webinar discussing them, but let's go through this. And so if you look at, when you look at your deductions, your itemized deductions, 
there were, there were essentially five categories. And so this is all listed on your Schedule A. And I, if you notice on here, I have a, a line that says traditional, which is in gray, and then the QCD, which is in blue. So we're gonna talk about traditional and then we're gonna move over to QCD. So traditional, basically, you know, when we take a typical, let's say 70 year old, uh, they're likely to have fairly minimal medical expenses because they're early in retirement. They don't, uh, they're not at their late stage of, of life. So they don't have a lot of medical expenses. State and local taxes, you know, if you live in California and you have, you own a home, you're likely going to be, have some, a decent amount of taxes that you're still paying. Uh, but unfortunately, because of the new tax code, you're capped at 10,000, right? So that's capped at 10, regardless if your tax exposure is 20 or 25. Then you have mortgage interest. So on this example, under traditional, we listed zero. We do find that a lot of our retired clients, not all, but many don't want to have mortgage payments. You know, they look at retiring and say, hey, I want to be debt free. I don't want to have mortgage payments. So now you're retired and you don't have mortgage interest. And the, the bot, I'm going to skip over charitable and come back to it. The miscellaneous section, they basically did, got rid of that. So part of the tax changes in 2017 was to get rid of these miscellaneous deductions. So essentially that has gone to zero. So then the question is, well, what's next? So charitable giving. So if you look down below and you can see there's a, there's a uh, deduction section that says itemized and standard. So the standard deduction right now is 27,800. So the reason why I inputted charitable giving of 17,800 is that if you add the state and local tax, the SALT plus charitable giving, that gives you the exact same number, the 27,800 for itemized, the 27,800 for standard. And so the takeaway that you should be looking at, and this is noted here in the margin, if there are no other deductions, right? If you just have the tax deduction and charitable giving, then the first 17,800 of charitable giving basically doesn't count. You don't get, get any credit for it at the federal level. You do get it at the state level, but you get no credit because you're making these charitable um, contributions. However, you would have just taken essentially the standard deduction. You don't need the itemized deductions because of how large that is. And so if you look how this essentially works on your taxes, you have your adjusted gross income, which is 150,000, your taxable income at 122, your marginal tax rates at 22%. So that's kind of the traditional way of doing things is you didn't really get any, so you gave away 17,800 in this example. And even if you gave away 10 or five, the same rules kind of apply. You don't get any credit for that. So the better way of looking at doing this is doing a QCD. So a QCD is a qualified charitable distribution. So it's basically giving directly from an IRA to the charity. So the check goes from the IRA to the charity, not to you, then the charity, from you, from the IRA to the charity. And by doing so, it qualifies as a QCD. A QCD is what's called an above the line deduction. So if you notice down here, the assumption was that just to keep, kind of keep analysis similar, you gave the same 17,800 from your IRA. Look at, as we go down towards the bottom here, and we look at AGI, your adjusted gross income drops from 150,000 to 132 because it's an above the line deduction. So this lowers your adjusted gross income. It lowers your modified adjusted gross income for Medicare purposes. It lowers your provisional income for, um, for social security purposes. So it has a lot of bang, you get a lot of bang for your buck. And then you can see down here, you know, this is not a huge tax uh, bracket, but at the marginal rate of 22%, you're saving about 4,000 per year over five years, it's about $20,000. And so the whole idea here is that if you are doing charitable giving and you're, you're, you're uh, many people are taking a standard deduction, if that is you, you can utilize a QCD once you hit 70 and a half to go ahead and give directly from your from your IRA, which is a much more effective way. And this really wasn't a big conversation until these tax changes occurred in 2017. And now this has been one of the better strategies that we can help implement because it basically just, you know, it saves, it's, it'll save you tax dollars and allows you to either put more, keep more money in your pocket or give more money to charity, which is a win-win in both scenarios. Okay, it's a little bit noisy here, um, but hopefully you can follow along. So we're, we're looking at kind of two screenshots. And so one of the, the tools that we're gonna offer to you as part of this webinar is just doing a, a high level, just tax, uh, tax summary. So if you look at the far left, there's a, there's a tool we use called Holista Plan uh, that we pay for and we utilize this with our clients. And if you notice here, we can run scenarios. And so we can actually run a scenario one that looks at the 2020 tax return. We can do a scenario two that looks at 2021. So given some of the changes, maybe you have more income, uh, you may wanna do a Roth conversion. Um, we can run 2021 projections. And then we can also look out to like 2025 if we want to look out in the future and kind of say, okay, well, given 
that I'm going to have to take my RMDs and different, different things. What's my tax liability going to look like in the future? So what it allows you to do is kind of plan for today, but also look in the look, look ahead a little bit and say, okay, so are there things that am I going to be in a higher bracket later? And so sh should I make some changes today? And that might even mean paying more taxes today, but paying less taxes later. So that's kind of this scenario analysis. And then we'll actually generate this report that has this scenario, this projection that basically just kind of lays out these key numbers for you, which will lay out like total income, adjusted gross income, what your deductions are, your marginal rate. So it's just a full uh, summary around, around your taxes. Um, a couple of cool things that this does generate. Um, these are two columns here. You can see this shows your marginal tax bracket. So it'll give you a snapshot of where you are. So in this example, we used a hypothetical client. They're around 121,000. They're kind of right in this middle of this 22% bracket, but it shows you how close you might be to be pushing into another one. Or if you're trying to do Roth conversions, you might want to try to utilize the whole 22% tax bracket. So it allows us to have some flexibility with the planning. And then additionally, kind of the dreaded Medicare uh, premium surcharge um, it shows like in this example, uh, this is the exact same client, their Medicare threshold was 172,000. So they were only a few thousand dollars away. So it was really critical that we kept an eye on that because we don't want to bump above that. Because if you remember, if you go $1 above, you got to pay that extra Medicare premium for husband and wife uh, for the next year, which is never a fun conversation to have. So that's kind of built into some of kind of the next step is if you'd like to have us look at this, we would just need you to share a tax return with us so that we can upload this and, and share some of this on our conversation. Okay, so now that we're all dreaming of being on a beach, uh, so reflection. So I, I guess the uh, kind of big takeaway on here is how confident are you in your current retirement tax strategy? And you know there has been changes over the last four years. There's gonna be changes in the future. You know, are you working with an advisor and a tax team that can help you with these decisions? You know, oftentimes we look at it as the financial advisor's role to really drive this conversation. So how confident are you in the current strategy that you're minimizing taxes over your lifetime? And then also in the strategy that if there are changes, you're going to know how to adjust and make those, those adjustments. And that's really what we help our clients with is creating confidence around what to do and how to take action when things change. Um, kind of reflecting back, what did you learn today? I do know it's like drinking out of a fire hose. Um, there's a lot of information here. Hopefully there were some nuggets that you can take, not only for you, maybe a loved one, a friend. Uh, please, you know, when we, when we share this, the YouTube presentation, please share this. Uh, and, you know, we want to make this available um, to those that, you know, that you care about as well, because there's ho hopefully some good information in here that, that can empower you to make better decisions. And then, you know, I guess the, the third part of this is how can we help? So, you know, people as, a, as an extension of, of our webinar today, I know we're going to offer a 30 minute consultation and we might just want to get into some of the tax issues. You might have some specifics around your plan, but you know, some of the things that we get questions around is, you know what, I want to retire, but I'm not hundred percent sure if I'm able to, I don't know if I can afford to do it now. That's something we can help evaluate. You know, we already have an advisor, you know, that's definitely a comment we get, but we want to get a second pair of eyes to make sure we're on the right track. You know, we know how important making these decisions to retire, starting to turn on your income stream and doing it in the right way. You want to make sure you're doing it, uh, uh, that you're doing it um, with confidence and clarity around your overall financial goals. And then some, sometimes we just get questions like, hey, what's my break even for social security? How should I determine whether I'm going to take it at full retirement or age 70? And so this was just a sample of some of the things that in, in our consultation, we can definitely address. I mean, we do want to take a a high level uh, approach and get a better understanding of your current financial goals. But these will be some things that we would, we can definitely cover and spend some more time. So, um, so the next step. So we talked about this, this was part one was, was this uh, more general education around these tax changes, the tax issues that are impacting retirees. Um, we are making available, and this is totally up to you, is to sign up for a complimentary 30 minute Zoom consultation to get some more customized advice around your own individual. If you do want to take us up on getting this customized tax report, um, basically we can run current versus 2021 projections versus 2025. We will need you to share with us uh, your 2020 personal tax return. Um, part of what we can send to you is our confidentiality agreement so that you're confident that we're going to protect your information. We also have a secure share file link so that you know you can upload with confidence and not worry about your, your sensitive information. Obviously, we are fiduciaries and so you know, we put our, inter our clients' interests first. We have to take good care of you and, and data protection is a big part of that. So just rest assured, if you do want to take us up on the holistic plan offer, we will take good care of your, of your financial information. Um, lastly, <clears throat> excuse me, 
Um, I did a webinar back in June of this year, uh, so just a few months ago, on some of the Biden tax propose and tax proposal uh, and some of the changes that were on the horizon. So if any of you want to get more into the weeds on changes around capital gains taxes, estate taxes, death taxes, step up in basis, 1031, there's a bunch of there's a bunch of proposals that are out there. So if you want to get into the weeds a little bit more, I'd encourage you to uh, watch this on YouTube. We will include this link when we send a follow-up email to you as well, so you can get access to that. And kind of the next step, um, as we go into year end, I mean, I, I, it's hard to believe that it's already September. Um, as we get into kind of the thick of October, November, we tend to be really consumed with our, with our current clients and making sure we get their tax planning needs and their year end planning taken care of. But what we did is knowing we were gonna have these webinars, uh, uh, two of them today, we wanted to make sure we reserve some time on my calendar to accommodate conversations. So if you, if you see on the screen, there's a QR code that you can uh, go ahead and just, you know, take a picture of, and then it'll, it'll access our calendar, or you can see the link on here to book an appointment. So what I would encourage you is if you have any, uh, if you, if you want to take us up on having a little bit of a deeper dive, a little bit more of a custom conversation, these are the two days that we've allocated September 10th and 24th. Um, if there's for whatever reason we have to use have to do a different time, you just need to contact our office. Um, but that's basically going to be the best way for us to have more of an individualized conversation because again, everyone's tax situation is highly unique and highly specific to them. Uh, so it allows you an opportunity to, to dig a little, a, a little bit deeper on your own situation. So I believe that is it. So let me, I'm going to go back to the screen, but I do think we have some questions. So so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read uh, just quickly kind of look at these questions and see um, if we are good here. So let me let me just uh, let me read this and make sure I want to cover this on the webinar or answer this independently. So I think I can read this. So uh, if I understand correctly, one might consider increasing IRA withdrawals between now and 2026. So technically now in 2025 to pay taxes at a lower rate. So yes, at a potentially lower rate. Then again, a, uh, a, so you might want to consider increasing IRA withdrawals. And then the, the kind, of, kind of the statement of the question goes into saying, then again, a Roth conversion would have a person pay taxes at today's lower rates as well. Is there a benefit to a Roth conversion as opposed to simply increasing one's IRA withdrawals? And so um, that's a great question. Um, and essentially, unless you needed the cash flow right away or within the next couple of years, just doing the Roth conversion makes more sense, right? Because if you essentially, if you do a Roth conversion or an IRA withdrawal, you pay the same taxes. The benefit though of doing the Roth conversion is you now have that money in an account where interest capital gains will, will accumulate and come out tax-free. Where when you take an IRA withdrawal and you just put it in an after-tax account, future income, future capital gains, you'll actually have to pay tax on that and so the Roth conversion makes more sense from a tax perspective. Now, the only caveat there is if you don't have a Roth currently and you do a Roth conversion, in order to take advantage of a tax-free withdrawal from a Roth, it has to stay in there for five years. Now, if you have a Roth account that you set up three years ago, four years ago, 10 years ago, um, and you have this account set up, the five-year rule just basically means from the first time you, you set up a Roth. So as long as you have some sort of a Roth and you do an additional conversion on top of it, you're not going to have any liquidity restrictions. But if this is the first time setting up the Roth, that would be the only downside of why you wouldn't do the Roth is you have to, it has to stay in there for five years. So, but otherwise the Roth conversion in, in my estimation, in most cases is going to be a better decision than, than increasing and doing more IRA withdrawals. Um, there's another question from same individual. Am I correct in understanding that you said the QCD requires that a person be age 70 and a half or, or older? Yeah, that is correct. So the qualified charitable distribution, um, you have to be age 70 and a half. And so what's weird is that was tied to the RMD age. And essentially, they basically, um, when they moved the RMD to 72, they left the QCD at 70 and a half. So that is correct. It's still at 70 and a half. So I think we are done. So um, I hope you found this valuable. Um, like I said, we are going to be um, we're going to be uh, sharing this um, with you on YouTube, and we'll be emailing this out. Please share this with family and friends. Anybody you think would benefit from this, and I, I'm looking forward to uh, having many conversations with those of you who are on on the webinar tonight. And with with uh, with that, I will end. So thank you, uh, thank you for attending, and have a great night.